Hi guys, I'm Spaceship and today I want to talk about my favorite Ratchet and Clank character, which is Dr. Nefarious. No way! I know, shocking. He's a character that got me playing the games because I actually saw cutscenes with him and thought, that guy, he's an embodiment of entertainment. I loved him in Up Your Arsenal and A Cracking Time and uh, then things started getting south. Yeah, let's take a look at the slow decline of Dr. Nefarious' character and maybe we can figure out what caused it, what's the core of the problem and maybe even how it can be fixed. Without further ado, let's get into it! We start our beautiful journey in Up Your Arsenal. Dr. Nefarious there is a serious threat. His goal is to turn everyone into obedient robots. Keyword obedient, he's not turning them into the robots as if when he was turned into one, he's turning them into some kind of mindless zombies. And everything he does he presents as some kind of pro-robot rights activism. At his core, Dr. Nefarious is obviously a mad scientist. He created two hostile species that attack us in the game, not to mention his robotic army that we have to fight. He recruited celebrities to push down his propaganda. He seems to have not only a lot of money, but also a lot of influence in the galaxy. Quark is an absolute thorn in Dr. Nefarious' side. But we learn that it's not only because he's a hero that once defeated him. He was his high school bully. Not to mention Quark was an adult when he was tormenting a minor. Side note, we tend to forget that Quark is older than Nefarious, at least 12 years. I mean, just look what stress does to people. And all those traumas are making Nefarious lose his cool whenever he's faced with Quark. That's why he hates him so much. He makes him look bad, he embarrasses him ever since his teenage years. He's just always there, ready to remind him of his past suffering and to make him suffer even more. Nefarious doesn't want to fight him, he just wants to get rid of him, to do his stuff. And that's basically it. Nefarious has his ideas and his plans and we are meddling with them, so he just wants to get rid of us. He's not picking the fights, he's not poking the bear with a stick to make it do something. We try to ruin his plans, so he tries to kill us, it's as simple as that. The thing is, Nefarious presents himself as evil for the sake of evil. But actually, he always has his own plans and goals set. He's not chaos, he doesn't just want to see the world burn. He's a capable, evil genius. Keyword, genius. Yeah, he might be childish, and he has slight problems with separating reality from fiction, whether it's his favorite TV shows or his own delusions. But he's not dumb, he's an intelligent person who's always one step ahead of us. He predicted that everyone would try to destroy his bioblade later, so he made a backup one. He knew there was a team trying to stop him, so he made a spy to infiltrate that team. Not to mention he's not just a fragile mastermind who hides in the shadows and makes others do his bidding. He can put up a fight himself too. And he even has a plan B if he loses a uh, one one combat. Because he does know that he can lose. So he just makes sure that he doesn't. He is funny and goofy, but he's not stupid. He may act stupid sometimes, but he himself is not. We learn that he used to be a squishy and was turned into a robot against his own will. It was an accident. It was a result of his own defeat. But he would never admit that, that it was a defeat that made him change something so fundamental as his own entire body. So he decides that robots are better, he's better now, it was an upgrade actually. Yeah, it was all totally what he wanted. He's now happier than ever and jokes on you Quark, I won, being a squishy sucks. <laughs> and robots will rule because I'm a robot now. I mean, hey robots, look how dedicated I am. It would be totally cool and legit if you would follow my ideas that robots are the master race and the future of the galaxy. The question is... If he really tries to convince everyone else or himself. Anyway, Ratchet and Clank kick his butt and he ends up stranded on the asteroid for many, many years. But he did put on a fight, not only physical, but also with his wits. At the end, he lost everything he had. The only thing left is his brains and Lawrence. I mean, who could ever get up again after something like that, N not to mention actually build something off of him? So oh, hello there! 
Next time we see him at the end of Quest for Booty, teased as a main threat of the next game. And the main threat he was. We learned that his asteroid crash landed on a fungoid planet. Fungoids is a tribal race that is forbidden to use technology. So Nefarious basically landed in his own private hell. And he tried to better himself. He went to anger management classes, he went on a spiritual path, he accepted the help and hospitality of these people. And only when he learned about the Great Clog, he was like, wait a minute, I can use it for my own goals. Why try fixing my problems when I can make them never appear in the first place? So he started to build an empire from ground up on this planet, with no resources, no money, no servants, well, except for Lawrence, no army, nothing. Just him and those very gullible and easy to manipulate people. He hired some terachnoids because he needed to import technology to build from. He built himself several outposts on different planets, giant space station, space fleet, and an army. And it all occurred in some time between the end of Deadlocked and beginning of Tools of Destruction. Because it is in Tools of Destruction that we see Zonis reaching out to Clank and trying to get him back to the Great Clock. And Nefarious had to infiltrate the Great Clock already to make Zonis bring Clank to him with the promise of fixing him. And again, all of that, all of that Nefarious did not do for a revenge to get back on Ratchet and Clank or Quark. He just built himself a life in another galaxy and it turned out that the key that he needed was his old enemy. He even told Clank that to his face that he's not interested in vengeance, that it's beneath him, he has bigger ideas. What lie did you tell the Zomi in your quest for vengeance? Vengeance? You think I went to all this trouble for mere vengeance? They say I make a maniacal. He wants to change something in the past and we actually never learn what he tries to change. Because throughout the game we see that he's lying to everyone about what he's going to do. He lies to Vorsalon, he lies to Valkyries, so why not lie to our heroes as well? And that idea that we only have this vague image of what his plans are is what's really threatening. Because with the power of the Great Clock, with turning back time, he can do whatever he wants. With no consequences for himself, for his image or anything. He might, for example, turn back time and kill our heroes as babies. He might stop us from ever destroying Bioblidulator. But I think he would go even further. Because remember, he's a very intelligent planner. He does know the consequences of every action. It's just that sometimes he decides to ignore them because he gets too emotional. I think that not only he would prevent his own defeat, he would prevent himself from turning into a robot because that was a defeat too. But why stop there? He would go back in time and stop Quark from tormenting him in high school. I think he would try to get rid of Quark before they ever met. I don't know how many paradoxes that would cause. I'm sure he does, but he doesn't care. Honestly, who knows? He might have go back in time and create an entire dystopian future with himself as an emperor or something. We don't know and that actually was very frightening because we know he's capable of anything. So anything is on the table. Throughout the game, he didn't just hire other people for money because that would be too easy for them to double cross him. He hired guys who wanted the same thing, the control over time to fix something in the past. Characters whose stakes are too high to ever double cross him. But the other way around, he was ready to put knives on their backs whenever they turn around. He only seemed to care a little bit about Cassiopeia. I wonder who was using who in this relationship, because Cassiopeia might have been his girlfriend just to make sure that he doesn't double cross them. You know, they were emotionally manipulating each other. Two toxic people in a toxic waste of their toxic relationship. Anyway, let's get back on track. As I said, Nefarious has his own plans. The fact that Ratchet and Clank are involved in this is just an annoyance to him. He just wants to get rid of them so they stop bothering him. It wasn't a personal fight for him, of course he would be glad to kill us and as we are here, he can as well get his revenge. But that's a side quest, a minor step back. It's not the main goal. He only needs Clank to open the Orvis chamber, he doesn't care, he didn't want to involve him. He knew it would make the case way too complicated, but he had no choice. Anyway, again, he's goofy, he's funny, he's over the top, but he's still threatening. He's capable. He succeeds in many steps of his plan. And once again, at the end, he has to fight us one-on-one, -on -one, when everyone else just failed him. 
and he does puts up a fight. In this game he's still a capable evil mastermind, genius with a plan. And there is a tension, there is this idea that we have to stop him, we have to put on a fight to actually win. He is dangerous. And that's what makes fighting and finishing him off so satisfying. Because we actually feel that we accomplished something. Our heroes really need to put in the works to stop him. That was really the peak of him as a villain. And you know what they say about peaks. The only way forward is down. So in All For One he's the most cartoonish we ever seen him. I always try to defend this game because, for example, the music and the background visuals are beautiful and the ideas are great, it's just that the execution is super cringy. The writing is weak, the jokes are lame and the fact that the game came out right after a crack of fucking time is really not helping. But what about Nephi? So Quark became a president, which is infuriating not only if you're a supervillain, so Nefarious decided that he's going to kill him. You know, now it's just a personal vendetta. It's just like every Saturday morning. He's the good guy, he's the bad guy, they wanna fight. So Nefarious armed with only a megaphone and Lawrence in something that looks like a sci-fi segue, somehow transported one of the most dangerous uh, wild animals in the galaxy into the center of the city, immobilized it and made a trap for Quark just to kill him. And that's it. That's the entire plan. It, this is stupid. It's not silly, it's not goofy. It's borderline idiotic. And then Nefarious falls over, Lawrence quits, and somehow he's on our side. And throughout the entire game, he's just like that one guy who was chose by the teacher to the group project because they were missing one member, but nobody in the group liked him. To say that everything in this game lacks depth, it's like saying that Quark has a slight tendency of not being the smartest person in the room. The idea of working with your biggest enemy is not a bad idea, but the execution that he just runs with it is stupid. I mean, some of their conversations are funny, like this moment. Can I kill him now? No. I can make it look like an accident. How? Ratchet. All right, no. But this is just a huge wasted potential. I mean, it would be so easy to make it make more sense. For example, when they're kidnapped by Ephemeris, let's have Clank and Nefarious having their memory boards completely wiped because they're robots and Mr. Dinkles has it as a precaution so no spy equipment is ever taken on board by mistake. So Nefarious doesn't know who he is or why he should hate them and that's why he works with them. Clank is his innocent self so he's persuaded easily that they're friends and they're gonna work out to get their memories back and get out of this planet. And their memory files are stored in the ephemeris, so that's the reason to infiltrate that place. And then when they get their memories back at the end of the game, Nefarious still double crosses them, but it's not just a publicity stunt out of the blue. But having his memories back does not erase the memories of what happened on this planet, so we can still have this cute cutscene at the end of the game indicating that Nefarious is actually a very lonely person and that he actually had a good time there, although he will never admit it. Or let's have him actually arrested right before them being kidnapped. He's completely disarmed and maybe has some kind of handcuffs that will deactivate him if he gets too far from our team and only Ratchet can take them off or something like that. So he has no choice but to help our team. But the entire opening cutscene is just that would require a lot of rewriting and I don't have time for it in this video. But if you would like me to rewrite the entirety of All for One, just say that in the comments and maybe someday? But anyway, I like to see the entirety of this story as just Susie, Kronk and Zephyr sitting down and just telling this story to the reporters with their own twists and filling the gaps with their own silly, cringy stuff. My mother was half Lombax. That's the only way I can accept it as canon events. As the key events happened, but how they happened or what the characters were actually saying is not clear. But uh, that's all for one. The fairy is there is just a villain for the sake of being a villain and a joke. Missing the key components of his capability, planning, and the genius in the evil genius part. Anyway, next time we see him is in the movie. 
because as you know, narratively speaking, I prefer the movie over the 2016 game. And we've got to see his organic self and... Oh... Oh my... They really outdid themselves with the design. His facial expressions, all of his expressions, his clothing, his ears. He's such an awesome space gremlin. And I know that it's fashionable to hate on the movie and say that it's the worst thing ever. And don't get me wrong, it's not good. But the one thing that it did absolutely great is Dr. Nefarious. He is less goofy than usual, but he's also now a shadow man operating from the back the puppet master, if you will. Having Drek so nerfed that he's barely recognizable, he needed someone who will actually pose a threat. And we've got the evil green bean. It is implied that Drek got him out of the prison to work under the planetizer. After Nefarious wrote him his resume? <laughs> I, I suppose? But Nefarious didn't care at all about the planetization. He had his own plan. You can say it's just a simple revenge, but I believe that it's a bit more than that. On the surface, yes, he just wanted a revenge on the Rangers and Quark in particular, because he used to be their teammates. And just imagine that, it's everyone's worst nightmare. You just finished college with multiple PhDs, and you got your dream job, you're gonna change the world for the better and be in the spotlight. And then you realize that your high school bully is not only working with you, but he's your boss, without earning anything. He's now above you, and he continues to bully you. And all those other heroes that are said to be the best of the best in this galaxy are going along with it. They're also bullying you. Just because you're good at your job. You called me King of the Nerd Herd! It was a term of endearment! Day after day, I slaved away creating all the weapons and devices that made you look like a hero. But you're not a hero. You're not even a good villain. You're the galaxy's biggest joke! So yeah, Nefarious snapped and betrayed them. And I believe that he didn't just want to destroy them as a revenge, he wanted to show people what they actually are. Bullies! And if those bullies are heroes, then you're a villain, of course. So he embraced that. A bit too much. In his eyes, there are no heroes and villains, there are just victims and bullies, and he was tired of being a victim. So he became the bully. The biggest one ever. I just like to believe that's his own twisted philosophy. That's why he's so open about calling himself a villain and others heroes. But I got sidetracked again, I'm sorry. So yeah, Nefarious is the puppet master in this movie. He manipulates rangers and drag behind his back. And he almost succeeds. He gets rid of drag just as he planned. He manipulates Quark to destroy the ranger's reputation. And he almost succeeds with destroying the entire star system. But of course he gets deleted and burned alive! Yeah, this version of his transformation into a robot is an even more terrifying and graphic death. Because let's not fool ourselves, he died, his biological body died in pain. We see how he was digitally scanned like the weapons that we keep in our inventory, which might be the key to the fact that repair bots were able to somehow rebuild his body and transfer his entire essence into a new one. I guess they plugged his brain into the robotic brain and just made all of the electricity and data flow there. That's basically how I see it. I was always fascinated by that part. Because we don't know any other character that went through that. And it seems like something very traumatizing. It seems like in some way he also is just first and last of his kind. What a lonely existence. Anyway, as I said, he was a very capable villain here. He didn't know Ratchet and Clank yet, so he wasn't able to prepare to fight them, or plan ahead with that in mind. But most of his plan actually succeeded. So again, an actual threat. Not to mention his less goofy and more calm demeanor made him even more creepy. In the way that he's just there in the shadow, calmly watching how his plans are unfolding. In the movie, he's at his most evil, calm, collected, and very dangerous. And he actually had an army, because he was the brain behind the Blarg's army. He was in control of the planetizer, and the army of robots that he built for Drek. Throughout the entire movie, he was in control. 
even when they've lost in Alira City. He was capable of coming up with the plan B on the spot, and they're pretty great at that. So he looks great, he behaves as he should, and he's an actual threat. What do we need more? And the next time we see him is the next game. Rift Apart! I know that in the meantime, there was also a pilot for Life of Pi, which is utter garbage and I'm thankful to God that no one ever picked it up. But honestly, this thing is disrespectful to everyone's character, so I would need an entire video to review it and point everything terrible about it. If you'd like to hear my thoughts about it, write in the comments. Maybe I'll review it. Who knows? I mean, you wrote in the comments that you wanted to hear my thoughts about Dr. Nefarious, and here we are! So let me know, okay? But yeah, without further ado, let's look at what actually inspired me to make this video. Rift Apart. When the first trailers dropped, some people were skeptical seeing Dr. Nefarious in an antagonist role again, me included. People are saying that he is overused, but I don't believe that's the case. I believe his character is misused and misunderstood. But not in the way of, oh, he's not bad, just misunderstood. But that the writers are forgetting about the core characteristics of his character. In Rift Apart, his characterization is super duper shallow. He's not a genius, he's not even smart, he acts like a complete idiot. We are led to believe that he was in hiding for several years. And the only thing that he could come up with was one exosuit and... Uh, Hiring some mercenaries? He doesn't even have a troop to his name. He hired a squishy gang that's known for everything but their competence. You can say they were just supposed to be a distraction, but no, he was the distraction! In the giant balloon of himself, which is a fun visual, I'll give them that. But the level of incompetence that he presents is just off the roof. Through the entire game, he's not relying on his wits, on his plans or on his intellect or on his inventions, or anything. He relies on luck. Pure dumb luck. And if you know anything about his life, you know that he's not a very lucky person. But here we are in Ratchet & Clank convenience store. What he was doing throughout all those years? Figuring out the coordinates for Rivet's dimension? Hoping that in the meantime, somewhere in the galaxy, Clank happens to work on fixing the Dimensionator, and that he happens to fix it in the way that it does require knowing the coordinates and not just putting it on your head. Okay! He relies on the fact that Clank somehow will be stupid enough to present this interdimensional device unguarded in the middle of the giant parade. Maybe it was on the flyers, who knows? Not to mention that at this point they were already under attack and they still didn't hit the Dimensionator and continued with presenting it unguarded on the middle of the street. He doesn't even comprehend that there might be another version of himself in this dimension where he always wins. Then he relies on the luck that somehow the explosion of Dimensionator gets him right when he's supposed to be. How convenient! And that Emperor is away at that exact time. How convenient! And that his servants are fucking blind because they can't tell the difference between this guy and this guy. Yeah, I know what you're thinking. We could be twins. How convenient! Then, even though his army is trying to kill us all the time, he's able to capture us only after we have a finished Dimensionator. How convenient! Yeah, he smartly thinks and puts up a bounty for our heroes' head. Good thing that nobody noticed and no bounty hunters came after us. Then, <laughs> lucky him, the Emperor appears just at the right moment to for some reason drag his beaten ass back to the palace. Not to mention that the Emperor somehow knew already what the Dimensionator is, what it does, and how to operate it without any problems or hiccups. Everything just works out so great, he didn't need a plan at all. Or to use his brain, or an army, nah. He just needed plot conveniences. He wasn't just nerfed in this game, he wasn't just flounderized in this game. He was turned into a Powerpuff one of villain. He doesn't have his own goals anymore, he doesn't have his own plans. He's incapable of coming up with anything but just looking at heroes and going, Hey guys, look, fight me, I'm the bad guy, you're the good guy, 
that's how it's supposed to be, right? And he doesn't have high tech because he's a genius who actually builds it. No, he just has it because he's a mad scientist and that's what they're supposed to have in their closet, just lying around. He's pathetic in this game. They just have him to have some insults thrown at him. He used to be funny, he used to be goofy, but now he's pathetic because the joke comes from the fact that he was capable, comes from the contrast of his terrible actions and actual threat that he poses, to the fact that he loves soap, operas and pop music. And I can't help but think that he was treated that way to make Giga Chat Emperor Nefarious look even better in front of him. I guess it would be just too hard to make Dr. Nefarious an actual threat, an actually capable and intelligent character, and then make a character who's even more capable and a bigger threat. Because I guess that would just require too much of good writing. They made that beating Nefarious is not an accomplishment. Because what he's gonna do, huh? It's just getting rid of minor annoyance. Something that any character could do in their sleep with one hand behind their back. Not to mention that Emperor's treatment of our Nefarious is supposed to be funny slapstick, I guess. But it's actually really uncomfortable. He's abusing him physically and emotionally. You would say that yeah, but that's how our Nefarious is treating Lawrence. But Lawrence fights back with his sarcasm and wits. Our Nefarious is just taking the beating because what he's gonna do? And knowing that he was bullied his whole life and now the other version of himself is bullying him? It's not funny! This isn't funny, Lawrence! And I would love to laugh. I laughed throughout this game. Most of the jokes land, but this is sad. Because with this power dynamic, I don't want to laugh at the person who's being kicked while they're down. Completely defenseless. What is it, modern Spongebob? Because they made one of the most capable and intelligent characters really, really sad and pathetic. And you could argue that he gets his revenge at the end by double-crossing the Emperor, but the Emperor double-crossed him first. And it's just slightly satisfying. It could have been much better. I would love them to go the route where Arnafarius is actually capable, because unlike the Emperor, he actually had to struggle throughout his life and overcome struggles. He learned from his mistakes and his failures. It could have been a great lesson about value of losing, because losing toughens you up. It teaches you how to not make the same mistakes again, how to deal with the failure. And the Emperor, who always had it easy, who had victories just handed to him throughout his entire life, would not see that, he would not understand the concept of consequences of his actions, because his consequences were always good, for him, of course. We have the slight indication that they maybe tried to go this route? When Arnefarius is telling to Emperor not to abuse the Dimensionator because it's not a toy, and the Emperor just shushes him. And it would be great if, when in final battle, it wouldn't be just our character saying, oh no, the dimensions are falling apart, which was told to us throughout the entire game, but never shown. And at that point, it was just a lot of portals opening. I don't see any dimensions collapsing on themselves. The ground is not shaking, nothing. It would be great if the abuse of Dimensionator was what destroyed Emperor, his own hubris. He wasn't listening to warnings by not only our heroes, but also Dr. Nefarious. And somehow the abuse of Dimensionator would destroy him. In a final battle you would see him cracking open, like, like those tiny cracks and portals opening in his body. He would be destroying himself, but he would be just too stubborn to stop. Because he has to win his own way, because he always does, that's how the things are supposed to be. And at the end, when he's like blown up or implodes or something, you know, when he's falling apart, the Dimensionator falls next to Dr. Nefarious and he just kicks it with disgust, seeing what just happened. We could get some nice PG-13 horror elements here. It could be a cautionary tale. But no, even his personal moment of little triumph got turned into a slapstick punishment. We could have had two evil masterminds working together, one smarter than the other. But we actually got one idiot and one strong idiot with money. Just one crueler than the other. So yeah, Ratchet isn't the only character that got demolished just to build up a new creation from a different dimension. Now let's get on theorizing territory. Why do I think this decline happened? 
I feel that the problem started with All For One and its reception. I believe that there was a backlash about changing too much. Going way too much into the silly category and changing too much in the means of the gameplay, camera angles and art direction. And also the narrative. And I'm afraid that the creators and maybe even fans too didn't realize that the problem wasn't that they went into a different direction with developing Dr. Nefarious's character, showing his more humane side that he can work with others, that he might have that spark of good inside of him. He might even be an ally. But that wasn't it. The fact that Dr. Nefarious was not the villain of the game was not the problem. The problem was the cringe jokes and nerfing him at the beginning of the game, trying to make a Saturday morning cartoon come to life. The idea of Nefarious switching sides for a while is not the bad one, it's actually a great one. Because what people mean when they say that Dr. Nefarious is an overused villain is that they tired of seeing the same thing over and over again like in Power Rangers. It makes the stakes of the story non-existent, because our heroes beat him at his best. How many times do we have to teach you this lesson, old man? When he had entire armies, influences, and giant weapons at his disposal. Of course they're gonna beat him when it's just him in an exoskeleton. It's not exciting because we know exactly what we're gonna get. Not to mention that it's stale, it goes nowhere narratively. Dr. Nefarious was the best part of the movie, but the fact that the movie wasn't that good, didn't make that much money and was received very poorly, makes it look like everything in this movie was trash and that every change they made was a bad one. But even the worst movies have something good in them. And in this one, it was Dr. Nefarious, both his design and portrayal. It's not just the problem of Dr. Nefarious, but because he's a character of pure extremes, it's the most visible on him. Him becoming the villain of of the game used to be an event, something that was built up, the conclusion of the trilogy, biggest event and threat ever, something that we really needed to work hard to overcome. With his goofiness it's very easy to underestimate him, but that's not a mistake that our heroes should make, or the writers. Remember what he's capable while having no resources, and then think what he's capable of if he was given all the resources, as an emperor for example. In Rift Apart we don't see his influence anywhere except for the nefarious city. We are said that Emperor Nefarious rules everything and that now our Nefarious is in control, but we don't see it anywhere. We don't see violent industrialization of the land. We don't see oppressed or captured citizens. Everywhere we go is just business as usual. Everyone is doing their thing. But as I said, this game has a huge problem with understanding what shall not tell means. And when you feel like everything has been done already, when you can't think of another evil scheme that he could pull off, when you can't think of any big evil plan or any way that he could be a threat again, taken seriously and actually do some real damage, maybe not make him a villain again. And if you still want to have him in the game, he doesn't have to be the villain of the game. And you still don't have to go the all for one route. You can go completely different direction. We can have Nefarious having a midlife crisis and trying villainy for one more time, stealing Dimensionator, but later seeing what an asshole the Emperor is, and reluctantly join forces with our heroes. That way, he doesn't need to be a complete joke with no power or capabilities of his own and we could still have the Emperor as a big bad. Redemption arcs are the best and most compelling things ever and we don't have to make him a hero on the spot. He can just be a reluctant neutral party who for some reason got dragged into the middle of whatever is this game. Yeah, he decides to help to save the universe because with no universe, there's no Dr. Nefarious. Hey, what are you, some saint all of a sudden? What has the galaxy ever done for you? Why would you want to save it? Because I'm one of the idiots who lives in it! I would love to see him as a neutral party actually using his brains for something. How about Dr. Nefarious's with a weapon factory? Him actually explaining you how the weapons work on the vendors when you buy them? That could be funny. He could work marvels as a reluctant cue to our James Gratchet Bond. Nefarious may be a homicidal lunatic, but he sure can't build a gun. But I'm afraid that in this day and age, redemption arts are just not a thing anymore, are not allowed. Nowadays we can only have three types of characters. The good good guys, the misunderstood good guys who did wrong things but for good reasons and they were actually the good guys all the time, we just didn't know it or they are controlled and manipulated by someone else. You know, the they did nothing wrong characters and the despicable villains who every morning kick a puppy have no redeeming qualities, no sparks of good inside of them, they're 
they're evil to the core, they were born evil, and they will never change because they can't, they have no soul. So why bother? Today, the characters cannot realize they were doing something wrong and try to do good from now on. You know, changing. And I don't mean deconstruction as morphing into something that they never were. I mean progress, next step in their life, changing as evolving. But I see that now even heroes can't do that. Heroes have to be good from the start and capable from the start. They can't have flaws that they need to overcome. They just have to realize how good they are and fight the bad guys. But I believe that Dr. Nefarious has the most potential out of all of the characters in this franchise. As I said, I feel like the creators are just afraid of changing the characters, of evolving them into something else. Just look at Ratchet in Rift Apart. And just like Ratchet as a mentor to other heroes, I would like to see Nefarious in a different role. Something that would come up naturally. Him finding peace in something. Still being his goofy and very mean self, but not the look at me, shoot at me, I'm the bad guy type of character. But then again, if it only bothers me, then maybe I'm the problem. Maybe I'm trying to just look too deep into something that has no depth. Sure, they flounderized my favorite character, but I don't own this character. I'm not the one making any decisions. And if the game sells and has great reviews, then maybe I'm the problem, it's me. But I can't help but see how much more we could have been given. How much more potential is in those characters. Potential that goes nowhere and it, it actually goes backwards. So I guess the only thing that I can actually do is just scream to the microphone for a few minutes Hoping that maybe someone will see it and agree with me. I don't even hope to change anyone's mind anymore But what do you think? Do you also feel that the treatment of Dr. Nefarious is wrong? Do you want to hear any other idea from me? Maybe my rewrite of All for One? Let me know because it is kind of therapeutic to scream my frustrations into the void of internet. And I guess I can always just turn on my PS3 and replay a cracking time whenever I'm not haunted by the newly hired by my psyche sleep paralysis demon. <laughs> Go away! Anyway, thanks for watching. Bye!